here at Space 53 at the Technology Base Twente. My name is Sandy and I have the pleasure of being your host this morning. So welcome to both our online guests as well as our live guests here at the venue. For the past two and a half years, six European countries have worked together on this project with the main goal to remove obstacles or barriers to get drone innovations faster to the new markets. Today is all about the results of what has been achieved in those two and a half years. And we're going to talk about that today with government, with uh, the industry, and also with academics. But the same goes for you. So to my live audience, always feel free to join in on the conversation. And the same goes for you who are joining us via YouTube. There is a chat option. I have an iPad with me. So any questions, remarks, comments, disagreements with our experts, everything is welcome today. So let's make it a conversation about aerial uptake today. As mentioned, we are here uh, at Space 53, which is an ecosystem for drones, and we'd love to hear a little bit more about who they are and what they do. So please bring a warm welcome to our first guest, Martijn Menon, Program Manager at Space 53. 
Welcome, Amartan. Good morning. We are at Space 53, so where exactly are we? Um, space, well, first of all, welcome. And, and uh, we are at uh, Space 53, which is an ecosystem and a drone innovation cluster. We are based here at the uh, technology base, uh, which, is a uh, which is an excellent an ex-military airfield. Um, and we're now trying to develop that into a high-tech uh, business park with companies um, dealing with a lot of uh, different technologies, but space is really focusing on the use of unmanned systems, yeah. specifically drones. So, so if, if we make it tangible, what, what happens here all day? Because I see drones uh, throughout the building. We have a lot of partners, uh, and, uh, and both uh, the municipality of Enschede and the province of I Overijssel are uh, like w part of founding fathers of space. Yeah. And together with, uh, with the governments, with uh, local users like first responders and commercial companies, uh, we, we test uh, new technology, we try to develop prototypes and demonstrators and also usable technology. Yeah. And that's, uh, that's a combination of drones but also software, uh, sensors, cameras, and that's what we basically try to, uh, to stimulate, to stimulate the local eco economic uh, activity, uh, technology development and societal acceptance. Okay. There's a university here in Enschede as well. I can imagine you work closely together with them. The University of Twente, but as, as well as the Saxion uh, 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 University, University of Applied Science, and also the the, voca the technical vocational uh, uh, ROC, as it's, as it's called, is part of the, the ecosystem. So that's uh, definitely an important yeah. part of our uh, uh, Space yeah. 53 community. Yeah. How important are drones for the regional economics here? Uh, there's still some, I think, some some room to develop yeah. that. Um, we would love to see more economic activity, like I said, not only specifically on the drone itself, but also on the application. So that could be software, that could be a sender, that could be counter drone technology. Uh, so that's one of the goals of space to help develop that. So, and I think there's a lot of uh, potential and capability here in Twente, like say, like with universities and the section, but also with the commercial companies. And a, and a very active uh, local government yeah. who, uh, who pr promotes that. So a lot's going on here in Twente. I'm guessing you're looking forward to the results and uh, to move ahead from those. Uh, exactly, yeah. I, I joined space in, in January of this year, so I'm, I'm a bit new to the area update. So I'm really yeah, looking forward to, this, uh, to the results and also the next uh, steps. Yeah. And I'm, I think I'm, I can be proud to welcome a uh, European delegation in our uh, facility. Yeah. So I'm very happy about it. Yeah, let's make it a, a fun and productive day today. Thank you very much, Martijn Menne. Yeah, you're welcome. One of the uh, co-founders of this project is Interreg Europe, so they're very much involved. And we're very happy that she took time in her schedule out today to be here with us and to tell us a bit more about Interreg Europe, but also about the specifics of this project. Because as a policy officer, she knows everything about it. Please welcome to the stage, Anna Mialiewicz. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you can hear me properly. And if you see me moving my head in a bit of a odd uh, way, I'm just being a bit conscious of this audio setup. Um, as Sandy said, uh, my name is Anna Mikhailovic. I am a policy officer at the Interreg Europe Joint Secretariat. And it is an absolute pleasure for me to be here with you this morning at this uh, very cool venue, if I may uh, use that word. Um, I am uh, responsible for the monitoring of this project with the uh, Interreg Europe program who is uh, the, um, the giving the finance for, for the implementation of this, uh, of this very successful project. So in the, in the next, I would say approximately 10-ish minutes, uh, I'm going to give you some facts and figures uh, on the program um, and in a way set the stage for the project partners who are actually doing the, the project to actually explain to us what have they been doing and um, the way in which they have been implementing the, the project. So uh, could I have the, the next slide, the presentation? Uh, nope, the actual presentation, please. There we go. Uh, I think you can move on to the next slide already. Um, so the presentation um, is going to be in three very short uh, sections. First of all, I'm going to say a few words about the program itself, the state of play. Uh, then I'm going to set the stage a bit for the thematic objective that we're going to be talking about when it comes to the aerial uptake project. And finally, which might be of interest to some of you who might be considering applying for new funding in the new programming period, I'm going to say a few words about the new, uh, the new programming period. Uh, next, please. Next. <laughs> so um, 
for starters, of course, for those who don't know, and I'm uh, honestly hoping that there aren't many of those uh, with us today, what is uh, Interreg Europe? Um, Interreg Europe is an interregional cooperation program that basically funds projects uh, which aim at improving policies at their uh, regional level by learning from other regions, which is why we have uh, six countries today who cooperate on this very specific topic with the hope of improving their regional uh, policy in this, uh, in this specific topic. Um, in the current programming period, by current in this context, I mean 2014-2020, because this is uh, the programming period in which this project belongs to, um, we had a total of four calls. Aerial uptake was on the fourth call uh, for project proposals. Um, and the program invested uh, more than 322 million euro in a total number of 258 projects. Um, these projects um, have more than 2,000 partners, out of which 25% approximately are managing authorities, and they represent a total of 90% of EU's nuts regions, which uh, in practice means that the project partners come from the entire um, area of Europe, plus Norway uh, and Switzerland. Uh, next, please. When it comes to the achievements, I will not bother you a lot uh, with these numbers because they probably don't need uh, much to, uh, to you, but uh, all of these numbers uh, are trying to demonstrate that the, pro that the program performs really well and that the logic of the program overall uh, uh, works. Um, the base of every Interreg Europe project is the identification and sharing of good practices in this specific topic in the, uh, area, of in, in the area of drone technologies. But overall, our projects have identified more than 5,000 good practices. Almost two, three, uh, two, um, 3,000 of them uh, have been published and shared on our good practice database for other regions and other potential programs to find motivation and inspiration in their area of work. Um, we have also funded um, 130 pilot actions. This is something that uh, aerial uptake uh, did, not, uh, did not go for, but the program, apart from the projects, also funds um, pilot actions which are more implementation and testing uh, based. Um, overall, the program is performing very well. This is this number of 132% of the target um, of the cooperation program. So basically, in the, in the beginning of each programming period, we define targets. Um, and so far, even though we're not even close to uh, the closure of all of the projects that we funding from this uh, programming period, the program has already surpassed all of its targets. So I think uh, we, can, um, we can safely say that the, that the leverage that the program has in general is, is quite high. Um, next slide, please. When we're talking about results, um, which is why we're here, uh, among other things uh, as well, uh, the way we define results in Interreg Europe I bu is by achieving policy changes. So the idea of exchanging experience and working together to ultimately um, achieve improvements in their respective policies. Um, so far, our projects have reported 915 policy changes in all thematic areas which has resulted in a mobilization of over um, a billion uh, euro, out of which 83% is from structural fund programs, because the, the main target of uh, Interreg Europe program is the change and the improvement of the implementation of structural fund programs. Um, in more simplified terms, this means that by every euro that the Interreg Europe program has invested in project, uh, 4.8 euro uh, has been mobilized um, with the purpose of investing in, in the topics that we're going to be talking about. So we call this the so-called the, the so leverage effect of 4.8. Uh, next slide, please. We can continue. Um, now, uh, on a more general level, when we're talking about uh, the topic um, that aerial uptake uh, is within the context of, of Interreg Europe, as you can see, as you can see here, we finance projects from different topics. Uh, aerial uptake is within the, the yellow area of research and innovation, uh, where we're funding a total of 65 uh, projects. The distribution between uh, different thematic objectives is more or less uh, the same, depending on the call. Some topics are a bit more popular than others. Um, in this uh, in this specific thematic objective, we have uh, yeah a total of, of 65 uh, projects. Next, please. 
Um, when it comes to, I think I might call them like cooperation hubs in this uh, specific thematic objective, I think um, even though cooperation happens between all different regions as, as uh, in this project uh, as well, uh, I think it will not come as a surprise that there are certain hubs in Europe where um, projects on, on research and innovation are a bit more prominent. Uh, one of those hubs, as you can see by these, uh, by these intense blue and red dots, is definitely in, in this region and specifically in the Netherlands, which is uh, one, of the one of the hubs for, for, for this type of uh, project application. And of course, you can see here the north of Spain, the north of Italy. So there are some regions in Europe which you're probably familiar with that are a bit more active uh, in, this, uh, in this thematic area. Uh, we can continue. And now when it comes to the specific topic of, uh, of drones, um, excuse me for a second, I think I need to. When it comes to the specific topic of drones, um, aerial uptake is, is a unique thematic case for us because out of the 258 projects, it is the only one that deals with drones. So uh, I was very happy that uh, I got to uh, follow this project and I got to learn a bit more about the so-called unmanned aerial systems. Um, since usually I would here indicate some other projects that are dealing with the same topics, in this particular case there are no other projects that deal with, uh, with the specific drone topic. Uh, I have indicated some other projects that deal with a bit more interesting or a bit more specific uh, specific topics, such as nanotechnologies, raw materials, photonics, and maker spaces. Um, hopefully in the next programming period, there will be some other brave uh, drone projects that will, that will apply for, for funding. Uh, we can move on, please. When it comes to aerial uptake, I'm gonna give you some dry uh, information here, which is relevant to us at the program level in terms of indicators. Um, the project has a clear focus on structural fund programs. This in practice means that they are targeting that four out of the five policy instruments that they're targeting are structural fund programs. Uh, they have so far reported 73 people that have increased their capacities and knowledge as a consequence of participating in this project. Uh, they have so far uh, improved six policies and mobilized around 4.2 million euro of funds. Uh, and of course, out of all of the good practices they have identified on the project, five of them have been um, approved and registered in the good practice database for everyone, uh, the community and outside of the community to uh, see and, and, uh, and learn from. Next, please. And finally, uh, when it comes to uh, the, the current or the, the next programming period, uh, this disclaimer does not mean much to you, but uh, this is just a, a small disclaimer legally that uh, all of the information that I disclose is still subject to, to approval, but it is irrelevant, so we can move to the, to the next slide. Um, the logic of the program more or less remains the same with some tweaks uh, because even, you know, like we learn from each programming period, so we make some adjustments from one programming period to the other. Uh, the program budget uh, has slightly increased. Um, one relevant change is that we no longer have the, the four thematic objectives that you've seen in the, in the pie chart. We have decided uh, to focus on one specific priority, which is the capacity building priority, which is something ultimately that all projects do. But um, COVID has taught us that the thematic orientation the way we have set it up has been a bit limiting in order to react to some changes um, like COVID has been a, a very challenging change for us as well and on the program level how to assist projects and regions in, in the best way possible to be more reactive to the to the contemporary challenges so we have changed uh, to a single uh, capacity building priority um, and when it comes to the countries that are involved, so in the period 2014-2020, uh, it was a total of 30 countries, 28 EU member states, plus uh, Norway and Switzerland. Unfortunately, in the meantime, we have, uh, we have lost the UK. So uh, apart from uh, the UK, um, the, the countries that are involved in the cooperation program have uh, remained the same. Next, please. 
Um, I will not uh, say much about this uh, on this slide. Uh, basically, the logic is instead of the program remains the same, we are targeting the improvement of regional development policy instruments through the exchange of experience, transfer of good practices, and the, the program is di uh, primarily di uh, dedicated to policymakers because logically policymakers are those who can make adjustments and changes to, uh, to policy instruments. Uh, next, please. Um, even though I said that unlike the previous programming period, uh, we have one cross-cutting priority in capacity building, it does not mean that projects are still not on a specific set of, of uh, widely defined topics. As you can see here, uh, the topics have extended, um, and now they're called smart, green, connected, social, Europe for citizens, and government governance targeted topics. Um, some of them were not so prominent and targeted in the previous um, programming period, such as Europe for citizens, governance topics have not been so prominent. However, as you can see by these little um, arrows here, um, there is still the so-called concentration principle, which means that some topics on the European level are still a bit more impor important, might not be the, the adequate word, but are still uh, more supported financially than others. In practice, this means that 80% of the total funds that will be distributed through the new program will still go to the topic of smart, green, and, and social uh, Europe. Um, next, please. Um, again, we will be financing, as before, projects, um, and also our, uh, on the other hand, our capitalization platform, the policy learning platform, which you probably know of. Um, the purpose, uh, next slide please, uh, the, the purpose of the policy learning platform in a very, uh, in very short, uh, in a very short line is to use the knowledge that we collected through the projects in order to share them with the, with the wider community and to make use of the knowledge and the good practices that we, co that we collect through the, through the projects. Um, for those of you who don't know, uh, the policy platform is not just a website, it is, um, it is a platform which offers different services and also uh, offers knowledge in the form of policy briefs, in the, po in the form of webinars, um, in the form of conferences um, and different ways of meeting uh, your peers and exchanging with them even outside of the project scope. And of course, uh, one thing that is very interesting and very popular among, among the regions is a so-called service of peer reviews in which you can apply um, based on a specific regional problem that you have. And with the help of our experts and other peer regions, uh, you can work on different interesting uh, practical solutions that can help you deal with the problem that you have with your region. Um, actually, uh, fun fact, a few months ago, I was in Lovarden uh, in Friesland uh, with one of the peer reviews, with a specific uh, challenge that they have in the in the Friesland with the Friesland region. So you just basically need to go to the website, check out the peer reviews, and um, and see if there's something for you. Next, please. Um, a bit of uh, money talk now. <laughs> um, as you probably know, uh, we have closed our first call for project proposals of the new programming period now at the end of May. We have rece received 134 project proposals um, and the average budget for pro per applied project was 1.4 million euro uh, and uh, the total amount of ERDF uh, funds requested was 192 million. Uh, we are currently working uh, very hard uh, on assessing these projects, and hopefully within the next couple of months, uh, the results will be will be in. Um, one more interesting uh, fact is that a second call for proposals is expected in the first semester of uh, next year, so in the first few months of 2023. Um, here you can see the distribution of, of uh, topics that the projects have applied for. As you can tell, there's always very popular um, topics uh, here, specifically green is the most prominent of the topics, uh, followed by uh, smart, 
so uh, in this way, the distribution uh, does not really change much from the from the previous programming period. Uh, next, please, and I think with this, uh, I will I will close my presentation. Uh, once we um, publish the next call for proposals, we offer a number of services and ways to help you uh, apply for the project, deal with the with the administrative burden of it, uh, find different project partners, etc. So once the call is published, you can always go to our website and to see what kind of assistance, uh, what kind of assistance we offer. Um, and with this, I will thank you very much for your attention. I think the next uh, parts of the present of the conference will be much more, uh, much more interesting than my uh, dry program talk. <laughs> but this is uh, don't this sell, is your pretty much sell it. yourself short. We have a question <laughs> from the audience, please. Um, well, obviously, we saw that the UK is missing, mm, uh, yes. and we're going to miss them very much. Very much so. Um, wh what is your personal um, expectation? Do you, do you see at any point in the next few years the UK kind of coming back, just like Norway and Switzerland are joining the program? Well, as we all know, I mean, this is definitely my personal uh, <laughs> opinion and like my personal thinking. Um, I think that the way that uh, the whole Brexit um, procedure has been has been done, I think, uh, does not allow us to make any guesses in terms of how the whole legal package and like <laughs> negotiations will will end up for the for Interreg Europe. So it's very difficult to say what kind of. Uh, I, I believe it would be wise to search for avenues for uh, for British for for UK regions to be able to gain some funding and experience from from other European regions. Because one thing's for sure, I have experienced from my side a lot of sadness uh, from our project partners who are completely disillusioned by the fact that they don't no longer can, can take part in, in programs like this. Because uh, again, in my personal opinion, this is top of the pops of, of European funds because you get to travel, you get to meet colleagues, you get to learn stuff and actually make a, a, nice, uh, a nice contribution in your region. So it would be sad if they did not find a, a way to do it. But I'm the door is open. I, I hope so. I don't know <laughs> what the what the what the legal provisions are, but uh, yeah, I think this is this is um, this is yet to be seen. We Only don't time will tell. We'll see in the future if yeah, the UK exactly. yeah, will exactly. rejoin. We hope so. We hope so. Thank I you know. very much for Thank your time. You. There's a lot going on for next year, so good luck with everything. Very and much so. Hopefully, more drone right. companies. Uh, yeah, hopefully, more drone companies and cool hangers. Where yeah. to we'll join in your future. <laughs> Thank you, Adam Milievich. Thank you. Yes, and not only Interreg is uh, Europe is uh, connected to this project, but also the European Union is involved. And as part of the Aviation Safety Unit, you are responsible for drone regulations throughout Euro Europe or on European level. We have our next guest with us, who is the policy advisor, or policy officer, I must say, on drones. Uh, online with us, Nicholas Eerdmans. Let's see, we have a connection. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, all. Yes, uh, thank you for inviting me. I'm sorry that I cannot join you physically. Uh, this uh, looks uh, like this looks to be a very interesting workshop. Um, I would have liked to be with you to learn much more about your uh, project, um, but uh, but I'm glad to be able to interact with you remotely. Yeah, we're glad to have you, and we've learned through COVID that this works as, as well as we can do. So. Um, you are from the European Union. We're going to hear a lot about this project. Can we first reflect on what has happened within the European Union for the last 18 months? Yes, so um, as you, uh, I'm sure you, you know, we, we have developed over the last few years, actually since 2015, a fairly um, um, complete regulatory framework for drones. Um, and we are still working on the regulatory framework in particular when it comes to the airworthiness or the licensing of uh, remote pilots and, and for the, the bigger drones. Um, but we've, we've now uh, established, let's say, the foundations of a fairly complete drone regulatory framework. So it, it was the opportunity to, to reflect on the next steps to take uh, into account um, the evolving policy environment, um, including, for instance, the, the recent um, smart and sustainable mobility strategy. And this is why for the last um, 18 months in the Commission, uh, we have reflected together with uh, the, the stakeholders, the drone stakeholders, on um, 
what should be the, the priorities and what should be the strategy of the union mm -hmm. um, for the, the decades to come. Um, what did we want to achieve um, and uh, what, need, uh, that what did we need to do? Uh, what actions did we need to, to put in place to actually um, achieve those objectives? Yeah. So you're referring so to, to the drone strategy 2.0, I presume? Yes, indeed. Um, that's that's the, the objective of the drone to strategy 2.0, um, which we intend to actually publish in the coming weeks. So we are, we're really very close to the end of that development. Um, of course, it's only the start of the, the actual work. But, um, but that strategy is going to target 2030, so a fairly, let's say, short-term time horizon. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we believe with, with a reasonable uh, ambitions uh, by that time and, and uh, smart objectives, things that we, we think we can achieve by, by 2030 um, and, and with a number of uh, very practical actions proposed to achieve those objectives. Without uh, explaining the entire strategy, because I'm quite sure it's still under embargo at this moment, can you give us a bit of insight on the priorities that the European Commission have relating to drones? Well, we really want to, to unlock the, the market and we, we, we really want to um, enable the, the development of uh, um, so-called urban air mobility or innovative air services. Um, and. Um, and the regions and, and the, 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 the communities enjoy um, those developments and, and uh, allow the drone um, market to, to deliver uh, new innovative services to the citizen. And this not, does not necessarily require new regulation. Uh, we are still working on the regulatory front, and I mentioned in particular for the, the large 35 drones, but there's much more to be done in terms of providing guidance um, developing standards, um, having standard scenarios supporting the, um, the, the operation of drones. Um, we've heard a number of uh, criticism of um, um, comments on the actual performance of the, of the regulatory framework mm -hmm. and, and there are a few things we can, we can try to do together with the European uh, Union Aviation Safety Agency to, to address those concerns and to ease the, the operation of drones. Um, Could you share an example of that with us? Yes. Um, I think one, one key point of pain is, is um, in the specific category of operations, which is really, I would say, a, a, an entirely new concept introduced by the drone regulatory framework, where you have a, a fully uh, risk-based operation-centric um, model uh, with uh, mitigations being developed for uh, particular uh, risks that are identified and um, this is something which is um, uh, relatively complex to put in place. Um, there is a steep learning curve and we, we, we were also faced with um, a fairly, um, uh, fairly frequently the need to go through uh, certification or, or let's say, airworthiness verifications of drones, something that was maybe not always proportionate or that would result in, in project overruns or, or large costs that were sometimes not bearable for, for short-term trials and, and, and experimental projects. And this is, this is one area in particular where we will focus, uh, making sure that the requirements are proportionate and making sure that we have in place the right guidelines to support uh, short-term trials, um, experimentations, and and not um, not end up in a situation where um, those projects, like it unfortunately happened um, uh, recently, some of those projects had to revert to simulations simply because they couldn't complete the the, the all the necessary administrative um, um, process in time and and within the budget of the yeah. of the the, the the projects so that's really one of the the, the focus areas um yeah. there will be many more um and, and a lot will be revealed in october or november with the drone strategy um, you're, you're mentioning uh, standardization and uh, test spaces and and the the ability to test freely is one of the focus points and we have obviously the industry here as well and the academics what do you need from them to take it to the next level in 2030 
Well, one, one thing that we intend to also establish is, um, is uh, a kind of network of test centers. Um, we have already established a network of uh, uh, use-based stakeholders a few years ago, uh, which is really um, a platform where stakeholders intending to implement use-based and more widely operate drones exchange experience. Um, but we think that there is, um, there is a scope uh, for a more focused network of uh, test centers and we, we even aim to actually um, uh, connect the uh, some military test centers with civil test centers and hopefully benefit from um, um, sometimes military restricted airspace which is used for for testing trials mm -hmm. and and be able to use that airspace also for drone trials to facilitate um, the, the experimental and, and test operations of drones mm -hmm. Um, and that's, of course, uh, a network in, in which we would very much appreciate to, to see um, academics and, and, um, and existing test centers joining uh, us and uh, exchanging um, experience and, and fully uh, cooperating with, uh, with other uh, uh, stakeholders. Yeah. So a wide cooperation of, of different uh, departments from, from government to, to academics to the industry in order to create those uh, test zones, uh, perhaps on military base, but also on the standardization. Um, we're very much looking forward to reading the drone strategy 2.0, so uh, good luck on the uh, final results for that and the final tweaks. Um, you all will be staying with us and watching, um, so let's uh, move over to the results from our uptakes, or perhaps there's something in there for you that you can take away from that. And uh, Wouter Asfeld, who was um, very much involved Thank in this project, can share a bit more with us, come join me, about why this project was uh, even there in the first place, what was their uh, approach, what action plans was in place, but most importantly, what have we learned and what results can we measure. You are the policy advisor of, of, of economics for the municipality of Enschede. Please take us through the uh, results. Any questions, please feel free to uh, raise your hand or otherwise use the chat and I'll make sure they get redirected to Wouter. Yes, thank you. Um, let me first say, uh, as the lead partner of the project and uh, uh, organizer, together with uh, Manon of this uh, conference, great to see you all. Thank you very much for coming. Um, there's even some stakeholders from, from the region, so uh, I'm really happy with the diversity that I'm seeing, and I hope that we'll have a, a really interesting, interactive day. Um, and it is my honor to uh, tell you guys a little bit about aerial uptake. Um, thank you, Anna, for kind of setting the stage, and also thank you, Nicholas, for giving some insight in the broader European context. Um, yeah, my presentation, uh, which is coming up now, is uh, meant to kind of summarize the project. So I'll uh, tell a little bit about uh, what we did, why we did it, and what we've achieved, even though Anna has already given some insight into that. Um, Maybe it's, it's good to say a little bit about myself for those who, who don't know me yet. Um, I am a policy advisor at the economics uh, department of the municipality of Enschede, which maybe is a little bit of an interesting position because um, yeah, the topic of drones, um, you know, it can be quite technical. Uh, it can go in any direction, but uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure that uh, I didn't study uh, drone technology. I don't know a lot about drone business. So uh, actually, you know, I'm in a special position which has to do with the background of the story. So maybe we can go to the next slide. Why uh, aerial uptake? Uh, well, this, this summarizes it. Uh, we wanted to save this dog, and uh, that's, that's what we did. <laughs> no, that would have been very funny, but um, uh, I think uh, it's, it's a funny picture. And uh, you see a lot of these kinds of um, uh, news images or stories where drones are you know, really funny or tangible or you know have have a certain goal um, but obviously the the situation where we're coming from uh, was different so um, we were just talking about uh, our history uh, Matthijs you'll meet him later but the, the background of aerial uptake we have to go way back to 2018 space 53 where we are now was kind of a newborn baby uh, we just had set it up and we were um, you know, really going after the potential of, of this new uh, sector. Uh, but yeah, this summarizes it quite well. So uh, we really saw the, the promise of the technological development, um, which 
as you all know, uh, goes at a very rapid pace, I think still, but uh, at in, in those days definitely. And then we saw the economic potential, so for the municipality and also for the regional government here, the Provincie Overijssel, this whole area, which was abandoned basically by the, the, the Air Force and later uh, uh, the Civic Air Force, um, you know, it had a big impact in terms of jobs. So we lost a lot of uh, economic activities here. And um, we saw the potential of this, this upcoming new sector of drones and drone applications uh, as a way to kind of overcome this. And also the societal things that you can do with this. So drones can, you know, uh, uh, make a lot of dangerous or boring jobs easier and safer. Um, but there's a gap, as you can see. So uh, obviously rules and legislations was one of the biggest barriers that we noticed. So uh, when Matthijs met kind of our uh, cluster here back in 2017 or 18, when we did our first lobbying actually, so we went to Brussels, we um, organized a conference on the missing link. So uh, you got this potential, uh, but you know, companies, even here startups from University of Twente, um, you'll probably see the, the roll bird somewhere lying here. Uh, they didn't have any possibility, any legal uh, possibility to test what they were developing. So this was kind of what we were after, um, you know, let alone a European level playing field, uh, which meanwhile has been established, but in those days not. We also noticed, um, you know, y you see that this is way above our head. As a local government, we cannot change the aviation regulations, but we noticed that among our peers, there was little knowledge. So <coughs> local and regional governments had very limited understanding of what drones can do, what they mean, um, and as a consequence, obviously, the, the population, the citizens, didn't know really what was going on. So you can kind of see the, the, the barriers here, and, and this is the focus for aerial uptake. Um, so you can go to the next slide, because obviously we couldn't do it alone, so we checked about in our network, and uh, I'm goi just going to introduce the partnership. Uh, this is the map. We um, got to know RISE, the Research Institute of Sweden, represented by Rasmus. Maybe you can raise your hand. Um, because the city of Enschede knew the city of Linköping, we had kind of a smart city alliance going on. And we figured out that uh, RISE is there, and it is home to the Swedish Drone Center. They actually also had a, a drone test center in Vestavik uh, nearby. So that made for an interesting uh, friendship, so to say. Um, same goes for uh, Jeju in Poland, uh, today represented by Marek, who's joining us online. So, hi Marek. <laughs> um, uh, that area is also home to the largest aerospace cluster in Poland, and um, uh, the regional development agency then joined the project um, uh, to, uh, yeah, to represent that region. Also with some interesting drone uh, companies in the region. So going further south, kind of through our extended network, uh, we found the city of Osijek, which um, surprisingly had some similarities with Enschede. Uh, they're also somewhat in the periphery, just like we. Uh, they also have a university with um, some, some IT and some technical stuff going on. So um, they were also interested in drones. They organized a big drone conference. So they were a suitable partner as well. And then going across the Mediterranean to uh, uh, Barcelona, where the i 2 uh, Research and Innovation Center also is home to the Barcelona Drone Center, the Catalonia Smart Drone Cluster. They also have a, uh, a, a drone test field. And then uh, they were accompanied by the uh, government of Catalonia, also joining today via stream. Hello, Jaume. Um, and then finally, we have the, the UK partners. So we have uh, John and Darren from the University of Central Lancashire. Maybe you can also raise your hand. Uh, and they were accompanied by the uh, city of Preston, Kat. Um, and also today in some stakeholders from the UK, uh, Dave and Tim. Uh, and I think some more stakeholders also joining us via the stream. So uh, good to see you guys. Thank you much for coming. Um, yeah, and I, I think, you know, it, it really kind of exemplifies what Anna has been saying, that this really brings together different European regions. Uh, six in total from each corner. Um, so that was a really nice opportunity because, as you can see, we had some very interesting similarities with the drone clusters and the test fields, but also because of our different backgrounds, some interesting um, uh, differences. So this is the partnership. Go to the next slide. 
Uh, I don't have to explain this anymore because obviously Anna explained Interreg Europe is all about influencing policy instruments. To be fair, uh, this is the first project that I did and in the beginning I had a hard time to kind of really grasp what is this. Um, so maybe just to help you get to that uh, uh, idea. In this region we have the operational program East. Uh, in the other regions you have kind of their counterparts. Um, and so our attention is kind of focused on changing these programs. Um, that's still quite vague, I understand, but uh, I just wanted to give you a little bit of a more concrete grasp of what we did. Uh, but let's answer the question of what we actually did. Uh, but before we get to that, I have to do a disclaimer, because obviously we were confronted with uh, the pandemic. And uh, sad to say that these pictures are the first and last uh, interregional visit that we did. So uh, we missed out on a lot of traveling, <laughs> uh, which you know, can be good, but actually... Um Yesterday was the first day of this final conference and I really noticed again how uh, worthwhile that is and how valuable that is to just have time together, be in a room together, go out for dinner together and really dive into the conversations that uh, on a screen like this you just cannot achieve. Having said that, I think we did a good job uh, because we actually achieved some things um, and I don't really want to... Um, yeah just read through the list of all the things because I think most of our documents are online so you can go through the details if you want but I'll just kind of give you um, some insight in I think the more interesting stuff that we did. So in the beginning this is a, a screenshot of the regional survey that we did with some questions and the responses of, of our uh, five regions. Oh I didn't mention uh, RICE from Sweden was a supporting partner so they had a little bit of a different status so there were five um, regions participating in the survey and what we did is basically establish, this was at the beginning of the project, we established kind of, you know, wha what's going on? What do you guys have in terms of uh, cluster? What do you guys have in terms of um, businesses? What are the policies like? And I think, most interestingly, what do your citizens think of this? Um, so we interviewed citizens through this survey and um, yeah, asked them questions like, what, what do you think of drones? And uh, how would you react if a drone would fly near you if you were on a walk and you couldn't really know what the drone was doing? And one interesting fact, I think, is that we saw all across the region that um, mo most citizens said, you know, I, I have a general positive attitude towards drones. Uh, however, if they were confronted with a question like, oh, but suppose this and that, and you see a drone and you don't know what it's doing, like, eh, maybe I'm not so positive. So, uh, and it was universal. Like, in each of the regions, the citizens kind of behaved in the same way. And um, a couple months later after we did this, the European Union came out with a big report and kind of confirmed what we found. So I thought it was a really interesting kind of exercise for us to kind of get into the topic and see how each of the regions was doing. Throughout the project, we collected good practices, uh, which also may be a little bit of a vague term, uh, but basically we collected interesting projects, activities, um, initiatives that other regions might learn from. So I think now the count is at 18. Not every one of has already been accepted into the library of the Interreg uh, program, but uh, you know they ranged from really interesting drone applications. I think from the UK partners we had a drone uh, being used for uh, rescue services in the mountains or uh, something completely different. Actually from this region we have the uh, readiness scan which was basically a tool for companies or researchers to measure how their drone was ready not just in terms of technology but also in terms of market, uh, legal, uh, social and ethical considerations. Um, so I think there was a really nice you know, uh, thing to, to grasp from the project, what we actually collected and what was inspiring for each of the regions. Another thing that we did inside journalism, we talked about it yesterday, um, this, this was something that we actually came up with during the uh, project uh, and we didn't think of it when we applied, but because of COVID, we were not able to visit each other and so we were missing out on these stories and these conversations. So actually it's a methodology from the UK partner, they introduced it and um, in the regions uh, of the project, we then uh, got some journalists to join us and um, get into the, the stories. And I think, and you know, it's, it's quite simple and obvious, but still I think it's very interesting that um, because of this, uh, which was basically an improvisation because of the pandemic, but now these stories are still visible. Like the articles are still there and the videos are still there for everybody to see. So 
in that sense, I think uh, we actually gain something from uh, having to improvise with, uh, with COVID. And then finally, another thing that we did is, um, uh, these are some screenshots from YouTube, uh, and you can still see the sessions uh, that we did here and in Poland, uh, and I think in also in the other regions, um, kind of debate nights or interactive sessions where we invited experts to come and discuss the topic of drones in terms of technology, in terms of ethics, uh, but also have citizens join the discussion. Um, so I think that was also really, yeah, nice activity that we did. Um, next slide, please. But what have we achieved? Well, Anna has already kind of given you some dry facts. Um, uh, at the end of the day, in the indirect program, you kind of look at the types of changes that you do. Uh, and we are mainly, we have mainly achieved so far, and we're almost done, but we've mainly achieved two types of changes. So type one change would be uh, a new project. So you got these policy instruments in each of the regions under which new projects can emerge. I think uh, we have about seven now, which is I think also more than we uh, applied for. Uh, we have at least one type two change, which uh, means that you're kind of changing the governance of these policy instruments. So in our case, um, the, the OPEOS program has been changed in terms of uh, future projects will be looked at also, uh, you know, so if an SME or academia apply for a new project, they will ask, have you thought about also, not just technology, but have you also thought about the ethical, legal, and social considerations of this innovation that you're working on? Um, and the, uh, the thought behind it was, uh, in terms of drone technology, this is a very important aspect because the drone can be super high tech, but if it's you know, not ethically acceptable, then uh, the drone will never reach the market. Uh, so we hope to profit from that in the future. But I think most of all, um, and that's also what we noticed yesterday, the first time we got together since uh, February 2020, uh, it's been a long time, how much uh, just being in touch with each other and kind of learning from each other has inspired uh, back and forth kind of the, the region's work. So for example, Space 53 was um, for uh, some of the regions a, a very inspiring example because they were kind of getting there. But now that, we <laughs> now that we've inspired them, they keep inspiring us because they are maybe setting some steps that we haven't done yet. So it's such an interesting kind of interaction and I hope that it will continue after the project. Um, so with that being said, I would like to, um, well, that's actually your job, but I think we're going into the coffee break, but I just wanted to make this setting the stage for the next discussion, which will be with uh, the project partners. And after that, the word is to the real experts. <laughs> Um, yeah, but this was my presentation. If there are any questions, I'll be happy to ask them, answer yeah. them. Thank you very much, Wouter. We'll di dive a bit more into the results and obviously the experiences from your uh, colleagues within the regions. Um, so what have they achieved? Ha what have they learned? What was their personal experience after the coffee break? Any burning questions that need to be answered right now by Wouter? Please raise your hand and I'm looking at the chat as well. Uh, but I'm guessing now it's just a good moment for a short coffee break. We'll be back at 10.45 for our online viewers and then we'll be back with the five European regions and discussing their experience within this two and a half years. See you in a bit.
uh, Christina Ramos van Jes from uh, Spain, Darren Ansel from the UK, and let's see, we have a connection with our online guest from Poland, Marek Duda. Good morning, nice to see you. Hi, uh, hi hello everyone. Good morning. Good morning. And then from Croatia, Igor Dalir, am I pronouncing it correctly? We don't have audio, apparently. Two seconds. <laughs> Let's see if we can correct that. Let's move you to our tech guys to take a look at that uh, connection problem we have here with all. Right. Do you hear us now? Yes, yes. we can hear you. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, maybe it would be a Yes, we are, we are here because we are using the, another mic. Very good. Maybe the cancellation. Yeah. Yeah, cancellation. We can hear you. Thank you very much. Um, we're now uh, going to reflect a bit on the results, but also uh, look at the inside. So what have you learned? What policy changes have actually been made uh, within your countries? And of course, look ahead uh, to the near future. Um, let's start with you, Darren. Is there is there anything that you found surprising that you discovered within those last two and a half years? I think it was one of the big takeaways from us from the UK region was seeing the benefits of places like Space 53 and, and the, these test centres and clusters around Europe. So I think it really does catalyse the, this growing new industry. Um, I, th I think one of the issues we have is a lot of the, certainly in the UK, we have lot, a well-established aerospace industry, but it's, it's largely been servicing conventional aircraft, you know, being part of the supply chain for fast jets and for commercial aircraft, passenger, passenger carrying aircraft. And to see these kind of clusters, they, they really can also help the existing industry to sort of pivot a little bit and start moving towards these new markets. And I think this, this, this environment as well really helps with startups and, and, and promoting the innovation side of, of, the, uh, of drone use as well. And at what stage are you now? Are there already the drone clusters in place or are we still uh, on planning on creating them? Well, we've, we've been using a lot of the learning from Aerial Uptake to help develop plans for clusters in our region. Um, and we've actually, we've gone quite far now in, in that we've got industry partners involved. Um, again, we're looking at facilities and the right location for it. Um, there are one or two sort of clusters forming in the south of England, but there's nothing in the north of the country, so there's, there's lots of room to create these, these, these centres around the UK. Much the same way that our European colleague was talking before about the need to have them across Europe. And I think there's a lot of benefits on having test centres that, that can interact and cooperate with each other as well, so that you can perhaps test out new technologies between the two centres. Yeah. How is that in Spain? Are you working on drone clusters as well? Yeah, indeed. I mean, uh, we used to have a drone cluster, but uh, during the time frame of the project, the government of Catalonia released um, many different strategies not to foster not only drones, but also different digital emerging technologies in the region. And so our first action, in fact, was to create a new alliance of different clusters, all combined together to increase the synergies among... Uh, that's it, and to increase the efficiency of the community itself. And that's it, that's what basically we are doing. And so the aerial take in this case contributed a lot in creating this cluster as well. And also our second action, which is ASYNC, uh, not only for the government of Catalonia by itself, but also the SMEs in the area to test drones mm -hmm. and the different kind of services that they can provide or the manufacture. If we look at those combinations of clusters, so bringing them all together, mm -hmm. I can imagine that required policy changes as yeah, that's it, indeed, indeed. We are doing our best, uh, but during the time frame, we don't think that we can achieve the original expected policy instrument. So we basically had to found the project with other funds of the government of Catalonia, but it's still we are on our, on our way to do so. Let's move to OCEC a bit, because I heard uh, about this introduction that there's a lot of similarity between you and Enschede. Uh, where are you at at this moment? Yeah. Where are we at? We are now at the beginning because if, if we compare to the other partners that inspire us, 
because they're really doing uh, great stuff. And we can see that there is a huge potential and it's really inspiring how they are doing, you know. They are doing very well, they are very specialized, they are doing the great things uh, that we could only imagine. They are doing it, so it, it was very inspiring for us and we are trying to do, to establish some kind of the cluster here because we are still a uh, little undeveloped region as a part of the U.S. sector, you know. That, that uh, the partners in the region are responding to the, the planning of creating those uh, The field would, uh, they need it and they want it because we have several really good uh, startups and firms from that ground that are now uh, known all over the world, for example. Some of the products that we that are produced in OSIC is used also in the United States and South Asia, uh, in Korea. Uh, one of the stakeholders is right now in uh, South Korea and uh, offering his uh, products uh, to the market there. But uh, what they lack is the, 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 the cluster and the connection of the people of that sector. Because they say, come on, people, there is huge potential, but we must do it like the other parties did it. So it, it's a good guidance. It's a good start. It's still a long way to go, but you get there step by step. Also, you have the, the cluster here already. Was there? Um, I think within the Space 53 cluster, um, there hasn't been a significant change that can be directly linked to um, aerial uptake, but I think uh, what, what I also tried to say in my presentation was that um, it's kind of a chain reaction that I see. So uh, as the other partners are also saying, like Space 53, and when we had the kickoff meeting here in the summer of 2019, um, I think we opened a lot of eyes uh, and, and it was very inspiring, but now that we've also seen the other partners in their mm -hmm. ecosystems and the steps that they're taking, I think uh, on the one hand it kind of gives some confirmation that the strategy of Space 53 and the development of our ecosystem, um, you know, it's sometimes it requires a little bit of convincing your, your stakeholders in this area. Mm -hmm. And uh, obviously it helps if you can see all across the European Union that uh, uh, like-minded people are doing the same thing and they're working on the same kind of challenges and they're working on uh, similar uh, solutions to societal problems. So I think that gives us some, um, yeah, some, some steam, some, uh, some momentum to continue what we're doing. Mm -hmm. So I think that's uh, definitely a, a big uh, win from aerial uptake. Um, and the other way around, I think it helped aerial uptake in, um, in that we had a European platform where we could kind of demonstrate what we're doing. Um, so, for example, the, the drone to go initiative, uh, which features, um, you know, uh, uh, a future target where uh, autonomous drones are able to support first responders, with police, fire departments, etc., uh, in emergency situations. Um, you know, that's that's stuff that's interesting for us to kind of do and establish here in the Netherlands. But obviously, yeah. such a solution is interesting everywhere. So. Um, having such a European partnership can, can really help to bring these things to a next level. Valuable for everyone. Yeah. You mentioned in your remarks uh, projects that have been act actually been implemented in Bali. Poland, and we move to Marek. Uh, Mark, share with us the, uh, the medical transport drones that you have uh, in place since um, I think uh, December of this year you've been going live, right? Yeah, it's, it's something new uh, in Poland because. Uh, from uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic situation, we tested something like uh, like bringing by drones some uh, samples for uh, COVID-19 uh, medical uh, issues. And after that, from this year in Poland, between three uh, hospitals in Mazowiecki exactly region, we have something like regular uh, long haul drone delivery service. So uh, between these hospitals, uh, five, six, seven uh, daily flights are uh, so uh, they can bring uh, the, the sample 
and it is much quicker than in traditional way. How that works in, in the in the day to day practice. So one hospital has, for example, blood samples, and then they connect it to a drone and send it off to the other. T take us through. How does it work? Yeah, it is, uh, the length between all of these hospitals is something like 70 kilometers. So uh, people uh, who are working in hospital, they have to load this uh, special container to draw, and then uh, this draw uh, take it to the, the other hospital. So it is it is really, really quick way of transporting uh, medical samples between uh, hospitals. So they generate. They have to to load the uh, the things to the container, and of course be careful with all, all these things. And uh, generally, our uh, Polish Air Navigation Service Agency appealed uh, to users of airspace to be careful because. These drones can operate in on this area. Yeah. So, by cooperation between government, between the hospitals, uh, and of course the drone company. Yeah, exactly. Lovely live uh, project that is a good result from this. Uh... Igor, um, you have a focus at uh, education of children. Is that correct? Could you yeah, share a bit correct. more about yes. that? That's, that's correct, and we are really proud of that uh, improvement that we make uh, in our area. Uh, from, this day, from this year and so on, we implemented the education of some kind of uh, drone school that will be uh, uh, produced and that will be uh, implemented in every year, next, next year and so on. So, the children and younger kids uh, will get the education in the poor sector. We, we will try to uh, bring them uh, even more closer to them, and they are really eager to learn about it. Yeah. They don't have any kind of obstacles. They don't have any kind of misjudgments. They, when they hear drones, it's only from the kids. They really enjoy it, and they really try it, and it is one of the biggest success that we are making here. So it's good for social acceptance as well when youth becomes uh, used to drones and, and see what the added value of that is. Yes, Lovely. yes, and the parents also, uh, when they see that the children enjoy it and that it is safe and uh, it is useful, they really uh, also have uh, uh, the thinking that uh, it is a really good thing if they don't see the negative things about it. Yeah, well, that's good because we need that positive attitude. Um, Darren, I saw you nodding when we heard the story from Poland about the medical transport. Are you looking into that as well, the UK? Uh, th there is, a, there is a, a project happening quite close to us here in Singapore. Yeah. A trial that's probably going to happen later this year. Um, but that, that sort of that, that, those sort of activities, one of the things we've been able to do is influence some of the European structural funds for the UK, and it was some of the last funds available for, for, the, for European funding for us. <laughs> uh, but that allows us to work with those kind of businesses that are doing these technology projects. Mm -hmm. So in much the same way that these clusters support businesses, we're doing that as a university now as well. Mm -hmm. So we can help um, companies that are developing drone technology to help them mature their products and move them closer to market. Uh, but also, interestingly, we can go to companies that are not currently using drones and see how they could improve their businesses and be more productive or operate safer or more, more cost effectively by using drones. Mm -hmm. So um, it's, a, it's a very rich area for these kind of showcase projects, you know, like, like the, the medical use. Um, and we, we just try to help as many businesses as we can over the next sort yeah. of 18 months. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Christina, if it's it's two and a half years now, so the project is coming to an end. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Walter mentioned it earlier, you, you've learned a lot from each other. Could you mention one thing that you take away from one of the other regions uh, that you've learned? Ah, uh, yeah, for sure. I mean, we are right now in Space 53, and this is one of the places that inspire us the most, just because of the cluster and all the space that 
companies in here has to test and develop their own solutions. So we try to emphasize that in our own action plan. And for this reason, one of the actions that we proposed was easing precisely the, um, the access of the companies and the government itself to the, these test sites we have in Catalonia. Mm -hmm. For instance, we have one with us, which is, I mean, uh, Jordi Salvador from the Barcelona Drone Center mm -hmm. with us. But not only that, I mean, uh, clustering was, I mean, it's, it's a word that has been mentioned several times during this session. And we also ha we already had the cluster, but we saw the benefits of keep on improving this activity. And so we combine all together all the different communities that we have, IoT, drones, blockchain, new space, artificial intelligence, cybersecurity, and we carried out new activities for all this huge community that we have. So you expand that beyond drones to see that's that there are it. many fields that you can apply this to. Uh, uh, that's it, precisely that. And we developed some kind of new activities that turn out to work quite well. For example, um, enhancing the networking among uh, our members just uh, to aid them the access to new technologies yeah. with the knowledge that we already have in the region. Um, also getting them to know what fundings that they had available in the region at the European level as well, and different kind of activities. For instance, we did some training as well, uh, such as uh, OCET did with uh, public administrators, but also with professional uh, teachers for training courses, like yeah. hand-on courses, let's mm -hmm. say. And it worked quite quite well, both of them, and different kind of activities with the community just to maintain um, their opinion alive and to keep on improving our own actions. So um, in that sense, uh, the steering committees that we had, the different uh, kind of actions we developed during the uptake supported that. Yeah. And it turned out quite well because, I mean, at the end of the day, you gain a deeper and fonder understanding about the, your, the region. Yeah. You learn a lot, and it's a, a lot of takeaways uh, for the future. Um, Marek, uh, you are, uh, you've been personally involved for those last two and a half years. On a personal level, what have you learned um, from this project? So I have learned, we have learned many, many examples of using drones in different sectors, and uh, it was very important, but for us, very important also was to create this regional uh, meeting group because in the project we have got something like a reg regional stakeholder group and people which are in the area of drones that could meet together and it is something really good even in the future because af after the project people want to meet uh, together again yeah. and they want to try to lobby something in the area of uh, drones. Uh, there are representatives of three clusters which before they not cooperate so so much like now yeah. so it is really uh, additional value of the project to gather all these people in one place and yeah. to create something like lobby group for the region to uh, to prepare some special uh, finance for drone sector so they, they've all learned the value of cooperation and joining forces together to, to get to the next steps. That's exactly, exactly. Thank you. Wouter, two and a half years coming to an end. Uh, a lot of takeaways from that uh, in, in concrete projects, but also in, in personal experience and in learning from each other and, of course, the importance of cooperation. Um, where do we go from here? Because you don't want all of that to sort of evaporate and then let's get back to business. So how do you keep it alive? That's a good question. <laughs> Is there an answer to it? I think so. Um, I think uh, especially yesterday when we had our final project meeting, um, uh, you, could, you could definitely tell that there's a lot of energy and interest to, to keep, uh, keep this relationship going on, even, even if the project officially ends. So um, I'm pretty sure that that will happen just because you know we know each other now, we're in each other's network, we know what each other, uh, everybody's doing, so mm -hmm. um, I'm pretty sure that will continue. And also I think uh, Aerial Uptake has, has really shown the, just the, the added value of uh, looking across your border mm -hmm. uh, and, and finding partners um, that are trying to reach similar goals and, and what you can achieve together. So especially for us as a city on the border with Germany. I mean, it's not new to us, you know, uh, in, in the Interact A program, there's been um, uh, other examples of, of kind of cross-border cooperation, but I think Aerial Uptake has, has shown, and this is also one of our actions that we, they were now working on. And actually I'd like to point out that there's some uh, 
uh, project partners here, some people from the DLRG yeah. and, the f and the fire department from Germany mm. actually joining today. Yeah. Uh, and they are a member of the consortium that is going to set up a new project now, okay. uh, which is basically one of the findings, you know, that in the topic of drones, there's so much we can do just c looking across the border. And, um, you know, if we can do it across Europe, we can definitely do it here uh, in, in the area with Germany. So um, I think uh, aerial uptake is really, uh, yeah, uh, put put gasoline on the fire that was already <laughs> there, uh, so to yeah. say. It's the start of something, uh, of, of a lot more, of course. Yeah. Uh, Darren, if you look at the future, um, where would you like to be within the next two to five years? Well, we'd like, we'd certainly like to get a cluster up and running. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got some other actions as well. I think that the fact that this has been sort of led by local authorities I think there's a lot more work we can do with local authorities, purely exploring how drones can be used to save public funds and, and, mm. and again, do things safer and faster and, and cheaper. So I think that there was a case study in the UK recently where um, a local authority had saved four million pounds a year by adopting drones okay. in, to do things like asset inspections. But it's not uniform across the country by, by a long shot. So. <laughs> I really like to start seeing those kind of benefits coming out and, and working with local authorities to make that happen. Yeah. So a lot of ground still to cover, but the, you know, one, once the financial benefits kick in, they start to, uh, to be open to it, right? Oh yeah, <laughs> so, so. Christina, do you feel that you have um, achieved enough when it comes to legislation on local or even European scale within this project? or? Well, um, I mean, uh, in early uptake project, and since we work with the local administrations, we know that we cannot um, influence the regulation we have in the drone sector. Mm -hmm. But at regional level, as mentioned, um, there are some margin for cooperation and also to improve the situation of the sector that we have in all of the regions in the consortia. So, yeah, I think that we are on our way. I mean, we have learned a lot with the early uptake, uh, definitely, and every region has its own path to, to go through. Yeah. So I think that we will continue with the actions yeah. that um, we have uh, defined and also continue with the cooperation because I've we have seen all the benefits about it. Yeah. So the train has left the station and you just keep it going uh, for the it. next couple of years. Igor, um, when we go uh, to Croatia, um, from your perspective, what could you share with our audience that uh, something that you would like them to, to, that sticks with them after today? What, what, what message needs to uh, stick with them? Well, the, the main message is that I could really say that it was inspiring to doing uh, this uh, project because I met uh, a lot of great people that uh, my partners here uh, are really said that we, are, we couldn't be there with them in person from the different cultures, from the different type of organizations, with the different type of mind settings. But at the end, when we sat and we, when we talked, when we do the, the work, we were on the same track. Mm -hmm. There are different languages, everything was so different, but uh, when we are talking, we are talking about the same things. And it was so inspiring, it was so it, it is good, it, uh, big uh, potential there, and we, we see that we are on the track there. Yeah. So the good things are, uh, uh, it needs to be hard work, but uh, after all, it pays off. It pays off. Well, thank you very much. As we've learned that cooperation together uh, leads to inspiration for new ideas. It actually has led to some concrete projects when we look at the medical transport in Poland, but also the education of children. The UK is looking at medical transport as well, and drone clusters are being constructed or even growing uh, cross-border regional uh, cooperation is being held in the Netherlands and Germany as well. So a lot of takeaways from this project and a lot of energy within the partners to uh, keep the train going and to move forward within the next couple of years to uh, overcome the obstacles for drone innovations. Thank you very much. Good luck on, uh, on all the, the exciting plans that you have for the near future and uh, keep us all updated. Thank you very much, Wouter, Christina, Darren, Igor and uh, Marek. <laughs> and good luck. Bye. Thanks a lot. Here, because uh, now we have the academics, or what do you call them, the experts, uh, Wouter, who are joining our stage now. Um, let's please come on to the stage. Matthijs van Miltenburg, who is from the Drown Council of the Netherlands. 
Abhijay Mersha, who is professor of unmanned robotic systems uh, from Saxion University. Matthijs Nederveen, who is project manager from Robar Electronics. Rasmus Lundqvist, who is research scientist from RISE Sweden. And last but not least, Dave Jones, who is the owner of Halo Aerial. We are getting them wired for a quick bit. We'll change up the setting and we'll be back with you in a few minutes. not only the results but the drones in general and their future with our five experts um, on the chairs welcome everybody um, Rasmus you've been with us from the start this morning what has uh, struck you anything that you said hey that is interesting or um, yes so it, it's been a it's been a, a long and interesting project mm -hmm. and uh, I think um, uh, what strikes me is that there's so much work left to do <laughs> Uh, we For example, <laughs> oh, the, the challenges are massive, and I think I think we are uh, really in the beginning of the era of drones. Mm -hmm. uh, when we when we go outside, we rarely see a drone. Mm -hmm. It's a rare oca or rare occasion, and I think that uh, we we're gonna have to be used to seeing drones in in the future. Mm -hmm. And the, the regulation that has uh, come into effect uh, during the pr uh, project. Uh really sets a baseline for, for drone usage uh, yeah. over all of Europe. Yeah. And uh, I one, of the one of the most interesting things is that drone flights beyond visual line of sight it will be um, possible. And thi this, uh, this uh, can already be done. And um, I, I think that um, that makes it uh, really interesting. Yeah. But as you from Drone Council in the Netherlands, oh. um, it needs to be more common in our day-to-day -day life. You agree? <laughs> yeah, I fully agree. Uh, I think it's really an emerging market. Mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, well full of uh, societal benefits, economic benefits. So I'm really looking forward to see this market really take uh, uh, the full potential. Yeah. And for that, of course, hey, we need to overcome legal obstacles. Yeah. But there are also many challenges, uh, as uh, Wouter pointed out, in the terms of public acceptance. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm very um, yeah, interested also to learn more about uh, this specific outcome yeah. uh, of the project. Uh, so ethical, legal, social issues are really very important mm -hmm. because if there's no public acceptance, 
it will not fly, no. literally. Because we learned from the survey that the, the, the project group take was people are fine with drones unless they're in their own backyard. Oh. Recognizable, uh, Matthijs? <coughs> yeah, sure. Is it work? Is it on? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, what we tend to see from end users is if they can see the benefit of, uh, for instance, saving lives, mm -hmm. uh, as first responders are using it, uh, the acceptance is much more than uh, for logistic-wise for yeah. the media itself. Yeah. Do we have a, a clear picture of where that, that, that line is? Is you know when it's for public, you know, if it's for um, a first responders and you say it's okay, then for logistic it's not. Do we have a, a clear vision of when people are okay and when they are not? Is that being researched enough? I think there's uh, still some extra research needed mm -hmm. in terms of uh, what is beneficial for society and um, I think the major uh, issue is uh, people tend to feel that their privacy are invaded really quickly. Yeah. How, do we, how do we move across from that? I, I would like to actually jump in here. Uh, first, maybe a little back. Uh, I think there is a lot of future for uh, drone industry in general, and then I think uh, drones would be a commodity in the yeah. near future, just like uh, everybody has uh, mobile phones and actually even there are a number of people who do have uh, more than one uh, mobile phone. <laughs> and I, I firmly believe in that because at some point it becomes really clear what the benefit of drones and generally technology in our day-to-day -day life, maybe actually even it becomes very indispensable par uh, part of our da da daily operations. Mm. Why uh, do I say that? It's because, yeah, we see a lot of... Um, resistance and specifically as already mentioned the yeah. public acceptance and stuff like that it's because uh, right now for the majority of the public it is a bit fuzzy yeah. uh, at the very beginning really now uh, 10 years ago or a bit uh, earlier most of the people recognize drones as the ones that are actually used in battlefields yeah. the new generation thinks drones are just toys <laughs> So we have a gap to fill in. Yeah, but and how, do we, we how do we fill the gap? Yeah, uh, uh, we are actually showing it right now. We have different projects. I can actually mention some projects that we have at our research group. For example, a flying hand, which can uh, uh, really uh, clean, inspect uh, wind turbines. Currently, we are talking about climate change and stuff like that. So, oh, okay. So we need to have wind turbines, uh, solar panels, and stuff like that. And how can we sh uh, utilize this type of opportunities to show the public what the added value of this type of robots? Okay, for climate change, we really need to move to green energy services, uh, uh, sources, yeah. but then how can we really make the green energy uh, sources greener? For yeah. example, if the uh, wind turbine stops for one or another reason because it's broken or it needs to be inspected, what are the added value of this type of drones in order to lower the downtime so that it can actually produce and stuff like that. So this has a lot of added value. And as Matthijs already mentioned, we really need to be a bit patient and identify which sectors that people can accept really at earlier stage. Mm -hmm. Because if you are talking about uh, safety and security, where you see uh, somebody calls 112 uh, here, and then it takes a lot more time for the um, firefighters or the police to go there, yeah. but then as we have already say, uh, showed it in the next level or the BIST project, where you actually send a drone, which is autonomous, it goes there within a minute and it can there actually there give you. There are many fields where it's a, it's a great solution, but we need to get that. Uh, exactly. So if you actually show this the sec safety and security aspect, yeah. people can relate. Oh, this is actually a situation of life and days. Yeah. And this is the added value. Most of the time, currently, the people, uh, public, the general public is unaware of this yeah. added value. So we, we need, need to, to capitalize on that one. Erasmus, we need to educate people about the added value. Oh, definitely. <laughs> uh, but we also need to educate ourselves on, on the new regulation because it is a, it is a new thing and a new beast that we have uh, introduced. And I, I, I still don't think that we understand or grasp the what, uh, what uh, this uh, regulation means. Because in the end, this means a full digitalization of the airspace. Yeah. And there's so many opportunities in that. Of course, the, the, the applications themselves, we need to inform people of, of the added value. 
but there's there's so many things that are are um, interesting in yeah, here. Yeah. Dave, uh, what's your view on uh, socio acceptance and how to achieve it? Um, I come from both sides of the coin. Really, I have my own company that that um, provides drone technology uh, to local governments and um, uh, schools, uh, various different departments, and then I also work then within uh, research and development with drones. So I see both sides of it. Yeah. I think the frustrating thing out there, as we were just mentioning, is the educated, educating of the public um, to understand the good of what drone technology can bring. Um, currently working with uh, Professor Ansel from University of Central Lancashire, we're working with a big project now to take forward drone technology into the agricultural field. Mm. And um, even though that we have been working on this for maybe three or four years, understanding what we can take forward, it's only now uh, we're having that open door to be able to take it with the funding and then with the cooperation of uh, various different people. It requires patience as well. Exactly, yeah. 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 And I mean, w we sat down with uh, a young farming couple n not so long ago, um, probably three months ago, uh, to put in for a large bid for some financing for a grant to, to actually take this technology into the, the, the farming community. And we sat down with this young couple, and within about 15 minutes, we were given 20 plus different scenarios that drones could be used within their within their farm. We're currently concentrating on one, so it is so huge and vast out there. Yeah. But time is against us. You know, it, it's I've been with working within drones for the last 10, 11 years, and I'm still trying to convince your normal construction company out there the benefits of time saving cost health and safety a lot of recognition here as well. exactly <laughs> uh, and this is the frustrating thing for myself and other colleagues of mine that own drone, drone companies yeah. is that you know we know what we can do with these drones and how we can help you know the three main benefits of health and safety uh, speed of, of, of data collecting uh, and the cost element alone yeah. and then uh, just one more quick example is i met with a uh, an agronomist who owns a large company that advises the large farming community in north of, uh, of, of England and showed him what we could do with drones for crop spraying and spotting where, and he said, don't, please don't be coming to us because we provide the pesticide. <laughs> Whereas we blanket, so we will blanket spray, so somebody's going to lose out somewhere. Yeah. Okay. So you also have and that's this what side of it as well. That's what always happens when we innovate. Always, you know, some always innovation. Win, some people yeah. lose. Sure. Uh, yeah. Matthijs, for, from Drone Council perspective, uh, we saw an OCEC that they're actually focusing on youth now to educate them, and you know they don't see the threats; they just see the fun part. Is that where we should start with the youth? Um, yeah, that's also one of the elements. But I also think uh, uh, what is needed is also a different mindset. Uh, we come from manned aviation, and here in the Netherlands we see, for instance, the inspection, the, uh, the inspection services, they still have the mindset of people working with manned aviation, yeah. which means that it's fully uh, rule-based. Here now we have to change, I think, the mindset, and it's uh, well uh, important not only for kids, but also for professionals working, for instance, in the inspection, to embrace the risk-based approach. And not to say, yeah, you can't fly over uh, a but highway. But as a former European Parliament member, you know you're asking a lot of <laughs> from them to yeah. just let yeah. go of risk yeah. and just, you know, yeah. go with it. Yeah. So it's very important to highlight the added services that yeah. drones can provide and to change the mindset, but also yeah, to find solutions, uh, sometimes technical solutions. We were talking about use space as well. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's really the perspective uh, that we have a fully automated um, yeah, services that enables uh, use space, but also that uh, yeah, uh, requests a lot of technical uh, solutions, how to make uh, drones visible to uh, manned aviation, but also yeah, to other operators. Uh, there, there are many challenges. Fly beyond the visual yeah. line of sight. Many challenges you mentioned. Let's, let's take them through. Uh, let's one by one. For example, the first thing um, we've mentioned, and I, I believe it was you who said it, Matthijs, earlier um, in our conversation, that um, there's uh, the from the first responders are trying to uh, to work together, and there was an idea of dropping uh, a life jacket into the ocean to help save somebody, but you couldn't test that because you didn't have the risk assessment yet. But in order to get the risk assessments, you need to test it. So you're sort of stuck in this vicious circle. So we need free test space. If you could just have a blank page and write up what you need, what do you need? 
uh, I think uh, first and foremost uh, that the first test should be in an airspace that is secure, mm -hmm. uh, free from other aviation, as well as uh, the, the ground tests. But I uh, like Space 53 is ideal because at some stages you need to integrate that with manned aviation as well to demonstrate that you can safely uh, separate and um, I think I think all the elements are there. I think only for us as an innovative uh, tech company, um, you are always ahead of the rules and regulations. <laughs> so it's it's more of a gravel road and uh, a frustration <laughs> that it doesn't go as fast as you would like. Um, but I think in the end, uh, through building uh, different use cases and having the ability to, to test, you can then uh, build up a whole file to demonstrate that it is robust. Yeah. So you basically say we need to keep, a as companies and as, as uh, clusters, we just need to move ahead with testing in order to get as much data to prove to, to governments, local or European, that we actually we can do this safely and, and to take them on uh, and to improve legislation on that part. Yes, definitely. And uh, maybe to bring that uh, to aerial uptake, what I'm currently missing is uh, how uh, the clusters, they are now collaborating together. Mm -hmm. That's really great. But how are we going to get the industry that forms part of that local cluster also to link with other partners in other countries, as I see a lot of duplication of uh, innovation. And for instance, um, we are also busy in the agriculture, how to uh, determine the protein levels in grasslands um, so that the farmer can mow at the exact moment to have the right feed value and also know how, many, how much manure he can put back mm -hmm. Um, so that the underground water doesn't get polluted. So if we can work together with other partners in other clusters, we can actually accelerate. Well, we have the first connection here. We have yeah. Dave. So <laughs> <laughs> well, can I just add on to that? Because we're actually working on something very similar. So this is where the clusters actually work. And yeah. this is, I agree exactly. It's, it's, it's all well and good having these discussions. And now this is, uh, aerial uptake is now coming to end, but it needs to continue. Yeah. And it does need to continue. It's all well and good just talking about it. Yeah. It has to continue because I know we will exchange yeah. contact details and talk about where we are now with that. Yeah, because I think this is really what Nicholas was saying when I asked him, what do you need from, from the industry? Is that we need that close network um, to just exchange and not, you know, not do it on our own uh, anymore, but to make sure that if there are two companies working on the same, why don't we join forces and, and see if we can get Perfect. to the next yeah. step? Abhijay, what's your vision on that? Yeah, so I think I just want to add on that one because, uh, for example, in the Netherlands, we have also more than 200 something uh, drone uh, companies, but then some of them uh, service providers, few of them just uh, developing the drone hardware and most of them actually using. And in the first instance, we need to actually create the platform and use the platform, create awareness. This industry is so big and there is actually enough food for everyone. But then I think it's really, really important to standardize and make sure that there is an exchange of information mm -hmm. because that would actually really help in order to uh, speed up the technological uh, innovation, but at the same time also for the legislations and stuff like yeah. that. So that's actually one of the parts that I really liked about this uh, aerial uptake, had it not been for the corona, but still despite the corona, uh, a lot has been achieved. Yeah. And then I think we really need to keep that momentum. And yeah. as I already say, there is enough food for everybody. Mm -hmm. And what you see, I am really happy to see from Poland, from Croatia, and also from the other uh, uh, European countries that there are similar initiatives, which is really appreciated, but at the same time, these similar initiatives can actually uh, merge together yeah. and maybe even create a synergy. And instead of competing. Yeah, and instead of competing, actually yeah. uh, s uh, create a synergy and move forward. And yeah. in that particular case, then you have a boost and you can easily show what the added value is. That's uh, uh, one aspect. The other aspect that is really, really important is I don't see technology developers or drone service providers or uh, whatever on one hand and the uh, government on the other hand. Uh, 
it shouldn't be like, oh, okay, you do something, I'm going to actually uh, give you the um, regulations and stuff like that. Hey, let's actually sit together and think about what the added value is and that yeah. if we work together, because if it is risk-based, it is fine, but yeah. then what are the risks and how can we develop either techno technological or other types of solutions Get for this risk? Exactly. Yeah. Instead of, oh, uh, you develop the uh, technology is ahead and then uh, and there becomes. With that, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And the regulations yeah. is not. Matthijs, stopped. This, this sounds like Drone Council that's Netherlands uh, work. That's <laughs> the objective <laughs> of the Drone Council eh, to have a public private partnership, <coughs> uh, to take industry on board, to have uh, the regulators. Uh, uh, to have uh, operators, uh, but both state operators and private operators, and yeah, to set the agenda for the mm -hmm. future. Yeah. Because the potential is enormous, but of course, yeah, before we can really uh, uh, benefit from this potential, yeah, we need to work together, yeah. public but and private entities. All of you are on the same page, you're in full agreement of what needs to be done, and which makes sense because you're all advocates of drones, of course, but how do we move from uh, agreeing that this is what we need to do, and that we need to keep it alive, and that we need to move forward to actually doing it. Because, you know, how do we get there? And not be this one of the many projects that we look back in 10 years and say, well, that was great, and it would have been great if we'd actually stuck with it. So how do we do that? I think we have to s stay together as we are now and move forward and, and incorporate other collaborators to come and in with us. Whose responsibility is that? Is that? Is that the five of you or uh, with, with the, this is the, starting the five block. before, so the ten of you? Who well, this, could be the s this is the starting block. You yeah. know, it's been running for two, two and a half years very successfully with great outcomes, as we can see. But we need to take it further forward and yeah. bring in other collaborators and then speak to the decision makers and lobby against different policy changes, et cetera, et cetera, yeah. so that we can then move it forward quicker than we already are. Yeah. Because it's taken so long to get to this stage, we should be a bit further forward than we already are. That's my personal feeling. Yeah. Yeah. So we need to keep not only keep the train running, but you know, oh yeah. kick up the speed a little yeah. bit more and just... Uh, I, I think I would actually add on this one. It would be really nice to have a roadmap. Huh? For example, how can we uh, embed this initiative in our normal operations. Yeah. Look, the uh, project can be a very nice uh, starting point. And then afterwards, it needs to be embedded in our normal operation. Otherwise, once the project is over, just like it today, would die, yeah. it would actually die out. We so need to stick let's together. Get, let's get to some real practice. You have a lot of students. It's actually <laughs> who's going to write that roadmap? Let's make it a project. Yeah, we have actually <laughs> a roadmap uh, for, uh, for, for us. But then, as I, I already said, I think we need to synergize with the other industrial partners. We yeah. need to actually do that together. And one of the uh, very nice initiatives that we have is the Space 53. Space 53 is a cluster. In addition to the testing uh, environment, the unique testing environment that it has, it has also knowledge institutes, uh, uh, companies, and uh, uh, public organizations. So with uh, Space 53, for example, we are trying to uh, write out our own roadmap and where to focus and show an example so that on one hand we can uh, make a difference in our day-to-day -day activity on the other hand we actually show what the added value of drone and drone initiatives are for the general public so that if we have the general public behind us yeah. the legislation will change definitely I, I'm, there's a lot of people looking at you right now martin and space 53 is being mentioned a lot so time to move to you um, what's your take on this? <coughs> uh, so I think you can hold the mic. Um, <coughs> yeah, I'm, I'm in full agreement, but that's that's easy to say. Yeah. Um, I need from agreement to action. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, like I would say, we, we're working uh, also together with Saxion and municipality, etc., to, uh, to a local uh, roadmap. Mm -hmm. um, maybe you could move on to some European uh, roadmap, maybe. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, but there's, there's one thing, and it's it's it's. It's, it's not fair to say that's only regulation holding up, because there's also a lot of technological development to do. Mm -hmm. But if you look at regulations, which is now the European uh, aviation regulations, local <coughs> governments can still make their own changes. Yeah. So if that's not, that's going to that's, that's gonna hold up that as well. Yeah. So I would, uh, I would agree with a roadmap, then a European roadmap, but then there should be some limitation, I think, in the possibility to to change your rules locally, because otherwi otherwise you're not going to get to this European uh, So it's uh, a standardization that we would Standardization, need, yeah. the part so of it. But is, is Space 53 going to be one of the founders to assure the future of uh, area uptake? 
Oh, I'm, ha I'm happy to take up that uh, <laughs> the, the gauntlet. Uh, so to yeah. be part of that, yeah. yeah. I think we we have a we have a strong cluster. We have strong partners. We have a, a willing uh, a willing government, yeah. and also good cooperation with the other test centers in, in the Netherlands. And uh, that's also one of our focuses to become more involved in the European uh, ecosystem. Uh, and let's say cooperation to yeah. see where we can add our specific value to the to the centers. And, and so yeah. Yeah, well, thank you. A lot of people were looking at you uh, as well, Bowser. <laughs> Happy to see this enthusiasm to keep it going. Uh, yeah, for sure. Um, uh, I, I think it's really nice how Dave put it. Like, it feels, uh, you know, the, the final event is actually the starting block. <laughs> so um, uh, I, I think from, from this discussion, there's, there's a few key points that, that, you know, can form the basis of new projects. Mm -hmm. uh, and, that, and that was also what I, I was hoping for. Um, and together with the information that Anna gave us this morning, I think this is really uh, definitely for the municipality of Enschede, which is, I guess as a local government is one of the kind of the, the target groups for a program like Interreg Europe. But of course, there are plenty other of calls and, and programs where you know you you get the funding to set things up, but you also get the networks to actually go into mm -hmm. the the actual implementation of of the project. So. Um, you know, th this this really is the uh, starting block. So we're so not calling it the final event anymore. We're no. calling it the starting yeah. point. Can we What's change the title still? Yes, we can still <laughs> change the title. <laughs> We've just done it. Yeah. But um, what is going to be your part in this this new kickoff? How are you um, going to keep it alive? Well, currently the municipality, it kind of parallel to the new strategy that Space 53 is working on, uh, which is focusing more on the safety and security application uh, uh, field. The municipality is kind of thinking about what is our role in this new strategy. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think for us, um, uh, it's it's thinking about okay, what is our next step in terms of being a launching customer, uh, the, municip the municipal organization as a as a user of drone technology, and uh, here again we can we can go back to the UK and see what they've achieved and demonstrated. You know, four million pounds a year uh, just by using drones. Yeah. Uh, what are we waiting for? That's Politicians kind of the sentiment. love those reductions of costs. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. so, so you know, that's something that uh, the municipality, as a part of the Space 53 cluster, can do. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, we we've just gotten a taste of of being a lead partner of an Interreg Euro program. So uh, for me, and you figured out how it works now. So yeah. So <laughs> the door is open <laughs> to uh, you know apply for a new project in the early yeah, 2023. So very welcoming to drone initiatives. So yeah. Uh, Okay. So, um, yeah, no, it's... Lots more to come. Okay, so we're not calling it the final event anymore. We're calling it the uh, kickoff of something um, more great to come. Perhaps to 2013, we have the drone regulations from the European Commission coming out in, which in, in a couple of weeks. So we have a great starting point. I'd like to zoom in on some things that were said. Uh, the need for standardization. I've, I've heard it from you um, as well. Uh, Rasmus, that's where we need to start? Yeah, we are, we are just in the middle of this. Uh, so... From my perspective, uh, I know that uh, all the entrepreneurs really want this to happen fast, right? Mm -hmm. y we got a regulation. Can we just get up and running now? Yeah. But it takes time <laughs> to standardize. It, it takes time. Um, uh, so we need to be patient, as has been said here yeah. before. But, uh, but it's, it's, uh, it's ongoing, so it, it's not going to take too long time. Yeah. Yeah. But what can, what can companies or governments or, or universities do to help the, that standardization to actually be achieved? Um, well, uh, engage, engage in the standardization process, because uh, uh, I, I'm involved in, in the ISO uh, standardization of the UTM, and I'm involved in the uh, Swedish Institute of Standards for, for, for um, uh, Drones. Yeah. Um, and uh, so getting engaged is a really good way to do it. Um, but um, yeah, mm, that's, that's the best way. How do you go about that standardization, Dave? Um, I think, uh, as was just said, I think is that w we have to continue now from here. And uh, even the points that have been made during this discussion, they need to be um, taken to the next level. And the continuation of that needs to keep going. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think the standardization, which is a little bit unusual for us because obviously we're, we're UK now yeah. and um, <laughs> everything changes December 31st for us. You're so we have to now <laughs> fall in line and redo our operation manuals, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that all needs to come <coughs> in the one umbrella. And I think we all need to move forward together and have that understanding. And that's why I said this collaboration that we have already, it needs to continue and widen and grow. So yeah. Matthijs, how do you see the, the role of the Drone Council within this standardization? 
Um, yeah, I don't see a very clear role, to be uh, honest. Uh, it's not the key point at the moment. Uh, we have a Dutch institute that's working on uh, standardization. And of course, it's important, but I think uh, that's something that's uh, an ongoing process. Very important, of course, for the sector. But to be honest, for the Drone Council, key is to enable uh, beyond visual line of sight flights. Key is also to have uh, communication between uh, uh, manned aviation and unmanned aviation, uh, linking the, the test centers in the Netherlands um, to a corridor that will be opened above the North Sea to test uh, will also be very key. Uh, and of course, well, the Netherlands, uh, it's a very uh, small country, <laughs> so there are a lot of uh, CTRs, uh, controlled zones. Uh, we also need to, to have uh, air traffic control on board to enable more flights in this uh, CTRs. And I think that's uh, already a big start yeah. for a council that have been established only in April this, uh, this yeah. year. So uh, I want to go uh, uh, with the council yeah. uh, on board when it comes up to standardization also because there are more specific partners in the Netherlands that have their own expertise and probably will do a, a good job. Yeah. So a, a lot of ambitions from your part, lots to do within the coming years. What do you need from uh, partners who are sitting here? to achieve those goals? Cooperation. Uh, cooperation is key. Yeah, but that's uh, a very generic, uh, generic term. Yeah, Let's make it tangible. Uh, uh, it's an emerging uh, sector. So I think it's, uh, it's key to uh, exchange uh, ideas in Europe. Uh, of course, not to reinvent the things that have been invented already by others yeah. in Europe. Um, so cooperation is key, uh, including also cooperation between the Dutch uh, Drone Council and Drone Councils uh, abroad uh, in other countries like uh, France uh, and even the UK uh, because I think uh, these countries are really uh, doing very well already in that perspective. Matthijs, um, if you could um, contribute to those plans that we've been talking about, you know, that, that to keep this network going, uh, make it the start, not the end, what would your role be? Well, what I would actually like to see is that um, the whole collaboration between the local governments filters through to industry as well. As uh, we, for instance, as a company, have a lot of innovations in different sectors, but our main focus are first responders and conservation. Mm -hmm. But as we already have some knowledge on agriculture and uh, inspection of that, with collaboration with partners within uh, these clusters, we can actually say, Okay, we have a network, but if that's your core business, then take on this innovation and we can work together and you get part of the network here and yeah. vice versa. They can link us to their first responders. I think it's uh, time to acknowledge that the world is bigger than just Europe. Yeah. Um, there's more than enough work and revenue to be gained uh, from all over the world. And also, if we look at, say, for instance, we have a prototype how to deliver uh, small AEDs. I know that Sweden is already very active in, in that field. Uh, if we can work together, then we can also have a societal impact in the rest of the world. Are you, are you basically saying that as the industry, as the commercial partners, you need to have the courage to share the knowledge and innovations that you have in order to bring it to the next level and, and put behind a bit of your commercial game by, by keeping it to yourselves? Uh, definitely. I don't think it's keeping uh, behind commercial gain. I, mm -hmm. I really am a firm believer in uh, common business. Um, this is also great at Space 53, for instance. Previously, before Space 53, we had to think on technology, rules, regulations, trainings. Now we all have different partners with their own roles, so we can purely focus on technology development. And should we ever have a question, then we can go to another partner and ask them, listen, can you solve this issue? Um, for us, I think it would be nice if Say, for instance, voter can link us, he knows what we are doing, to someone in Sweden or UK who has a similar interest, so that uh, on industry level we can also start uh, collaborating. <laughs> As most issues and challenges that arises, which uh, are linked to policies, comes from industry and end users. 
So if, if I'm summarizing what we've said this morning is that there, if you look at regulations, there is there are still there's a lot to be improved, but we have a lot of opportunities <coughs> within that as well. We see when we look at the uh, drone strategy 2.0 from the European Commission that they have the same need for free test space as you are all asking for, and then maybe as the industry and, and the researchers, you just need to <coughs> keep moving ahead and get those data and practices so that you can show to legislation that we can actually do this and then legislation will normally follow. Public acceptance is very important, you know, show them the added value and just educate the children, but also <laughs> to share whatever is done. But most importantly, that we need to make this a kickoff and not a final event because we need this network. We need to keep connected and uh, the cooperation and from that standardization will follow. It sounds so easy. Yeah, it is easy. Yeah. It is. <laughs> so where are we at in 2030 then, Amit Yeah, in 2030 we will actually see, I don't know, somebody has uh, made a remark that we don't see the drones uh, that often. Yeah. And I think in 2030 we will see a lot of uh, drones flying around for a reason. Mm -hmm. uh, so it would be really common and we are not going to talk about uh, public acceptance and stuff like that. Rather, we will be talking about what a great idea drones are and how they are actually changing our day-to-day -day life. That would be it in 2030. Dave, do you feel that th that, that future ABJ is just a, a picturing for us? Is that only for a commercial, <coughs> uh, logistic purposes, or is it just, you know, the common good that everyone has a drone and you just, you know, fly the, the sugar to the neighbors because they're running out? It will be commonplace, I think. We, uh, for example, uh, there is a, uh, a village in Ireland that is actually delivering Food, sa uh, food and drink now, and it has been for a number of months, that has just not hit national or international news. Why? I really don't know. Um, they were one of the first and they're continuing and they're progressing. They've made, I think it's 30,000 flights already. So all the fast food chains will then be delivering our exactly. pizzas and burgers. It's so many drinks. companies now uh, all across the world are, are coming forward because we work with a project where SMEs come to us. So they, they want to develop. Um, they want to develop uh, similar, similar companies, yeah. but it's already out there. Yeah. It's already out there. So they're well, we asking need to be a bit more proud and showcase at everything that you've already been doing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah sure. I'm, uh, uh, my, my colleague and myself, we've been working with the Cambodian government for the last six years with their anti-mining program. Well, yesterday was in the news, there's a Ukrainian boy who, who developed a, a, a drone that can actually detect mines and um, uh, do the mine sweeping. And he received, I think, a scholarship for 100,000 euros, so. Right, well, we, we've, we've had contact with a, a number of people. <laughs> well, we've had contact with people in Ukraine already. They yeah. contacted us yeah, okay. through the projects we've been doing in Cambodia. So we need to embrace youth and their, their enthusiasm and yes. their willingness to uh, embrace this. Yeah. Asmus, any other final wishes for the future that you'd like to share? Uh, wishes for the future? Well, I, we've heard it all here. I mean, we want to keep this uh, going. Uh, we have a lot of challenges, but there's, uh, s the opportunities are, are, are even more. And I think um, um, there's no reason to wait for, it for anything. The, the everything is possible today yeah. to do. So just uh, go do it. Go do it. Go with it. Well, what we've learned this morning is that we don't have a final event, but we have a kickoff of something new, of a bright future ahead for drones where we remove obstacles to get that innovation faster to the market. Because we have the knowledge, we have all those inspiring uh, projects and uh, examples that we can share with each other. We have a basic network now with five regions who are able to find each other. And even just during this discussion, we've connected two new partners who can actually collaborate together. So share that knowledge and experience experience uh, to help each other move ahead to the future where drones are just a common good where everybody has one in their own backyards and pizzas are being delivered by drones and not only by delivery guys. We need to move ahead because legislation is there but it's always going to be a bit behind so keep progressing in those clusters with free test space and make sure that we write the future legislation so that drones can be a common good. Anna is very happy to welcome new drone projects because this one was a very unique one and the only one. So the future is there, the future is ready for you and you just need to keep the train moving, kick up the speed a bit and just uh, do and go ahead with it. Thank you very much for being with us this morning. Our guests who are here in the studio will be joining us. We're going on field trips, sort of like we're back in school. 
We get to uh, visit the vi fire station in Glanerbrug to see what they are doing with drones. And then we move to the university uh, to hear from uh, the manager of the drone team from the university, who's actually already with us, and to hear from Incubase. But first, we have a quick lunch break and get that network started. Because to everybody, the main message is it doesn't end today. This is where we start. Thank you very much. Good luck on the future. And I uh, hope to see you again later. And thanks to my guests. Thank you.